Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode 101, and this is something I've been wanting to do for a while. You know, we're this is an episode mainly for marching band directors. So if you're curious and you're not a marching band director, stay tuned. But this is for those of us who are entering our marching band seasons. Um, back in January, Jeff and I did a great interview with Josh Gall from Ultimate Drill Book or the UDB app. And this is something that has revolutionized the marching industry, I believe. Uh, from an educational standpoint, and I wanted to bring this interview to you again. So this is not a new interview, but many of you have not heard this. This is episode 61, I believe, back from early in this year, and I wanted to make sure you got a chance to uh, check it out. So here it is. Welcome back, everybody, to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode 61 with Josh Gall from Ultimate Drill Book or UDB app. We're really excited to be here meeting with them. But Jeff, we've actually never done this in person together. No, we've always done it. Uh, quite a ways away from one another. <laughs> so, but we're, it's January and you're here at my house so that we can do a marching band meeting later. Yes, we are. Right. So I appreciate you driving in. No problem. It was fun. Yeah. And Jeff is actually the reason why we're talking about Ultimate Drill Book because a number of years ago you came to me and you said, hey, there's this new product. And we started with the, the flip folders mm -hmm. and then we moved to the app and all that. So um, for those teachers who are not marching band teachers, I would urge you to hang on and also check it out because there's lots in here that you could do in the future. And what I love about your story, Josh, and to be honest, I don't know much about it. I'm looking forward to hearing more about it, but about what your history is in music education and marching arts and all that, and how you then started the business through this and helped the music education world tremendously through your work. So I want to start with a thank you for what you've done for our, for our community. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. And and thank you for for recognizing that. I mean, it's so much of what we do is a labor of love. And, you know, Luke and I, my brother and I, who co-founded the business, you know, every decision that we make is through the lens of an educator, you know, and so that's that means a lot that it, it feels that way to you all. It does. So can you tell us a little bit about your background, both you and your brother and, and all that? Yeah, yeah. So um Interestingly enough, our dad was our band director. Um, there's actually four four sons. Uh, I'm the oldest. Luke is the youngest. And in between us are Jacob, uh, who's a percussion specialist um, here in the Austin area, and Leander. Um, he's also the battery caption head at the Cadets and has been there for a long time. And then uh, next brother, Gabriel, uh, is a professional musician who lives in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and then Luke and both Luke and I live here in Austin and uh, our dad was our band director. Um, he did his undergraduate work at Penn state, um, in music education. Then he did his, uh, graduate work at the university of Texas at Austin in euphonium performance. And, uh, he did the drum corps thing, which I'm sure we'll get into in a, in a minute. Um, did that for a number of years. And then, um, we're originally from from Richmond, and so I did my my undergraduate work at Virginia Commonwealth University, um, otherwise known as VCU, um, and then yeah. did, did my graduate work at the University of Florida, and I taught uh, at the high school level in Virginia, Florida, and then I just finished up a stint at the University of Texas at Austin, where I was one of the uh, the band directors and conducting faculty there. Um, yeah, so that's sort of our academic background, if you will. Um, oh, Luke, forgive me yeah. if I missed it, but what was the name of the high school that your dad was the band director at for you? Goochland High School, uh, which is a real place. It sounds like it's from like a Dr. Seuss, um, you know, um, <laughs> play or something like that. But it's in Central Virginia, and um, he's retired now. He's a uh, professional amateur golfer and uh, still teaches a bunch of uh, music lessons. Incredible teacher and taught for about 36 years. And so uh, when he got to the county that he was employed in, there were seven kids in band in the whole county uh, between elementary, middle school and high school. Uh, and then when he retired, there was um, there was a few hundred students. And I mean, it's a very, very small county, but it was really, really informative, honestly, is a huge part of our upbringing, having him as our band director and the things that he made us do, you know, <laughs> and mm -hmm. created opportunities for us. Um, so, so much of our education is based around that, but then all, of course what we did academically and then our time in drum corps and both he and I have a, a dense history doing the drum corps thing as well. That's great. So does Luke live in Texas with you as well? Yeah, we both live here in Austin. 
um, and uh, just about 15 minutes from each other. And we've got an office and a studio here uh, where we do a lot of multimedia work, but we also, you know, have a team now that supports all of the things UDB and Beam and Stride, uh, which is a new media platform. And maybe we'll talk about some of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, we've got a rock star team of seven full-time employees, um, about to be eight. Um, and yeah, Austin is our home base. So I'm curious how you go from being a band director with music education background to being able to start doing a startup company. Like, like, what is that? What's that all about? Well, um, you, you know, of course I, that question gets asked of us more and more um, because they're like, how do you go from theory, you know, to, you know, understanding the finances of a business or marketing? Um, Truthfully, you know, both of our parents who are, were professional musicians for many, many, many years. um, I think that we learned sort of the skill of troubleshooting and thinking creatively from them. Um, And certainly our, our profession and, you know, just music in general, I think encourages the creative thinker to, to use their skills. So, um, we sort of, we sort of grew up with a little bit of like an entrepreneurial sort of ecosystem. You know, both of our parents had to figure out how to make ends meet when they were professional musicians, you know, before my dad was teaching. And, um, you know, so this is actually the second company that, um, we've been a part of, uh, the first company was a company that I founded with, with my family also, I was a junior in high school and we ran a recording company for, uh, for the performing arts. And so we would do everything from like, uh, you know, the Richmond symphony concert series to all state band and orchestra to, you know, Christmas productions at the local church or whatever it might be. But, you know, we were doing, uh, a good bit of business, um, mostly along the East coast. And so that was really sort of the jumping off point for Luke and I to, um, to believe that we could we could do something together and both he and I are, are very like-minded in that that way and um we sort of got a wild hair and and some of the our experiences in drum corps also sort of led us to believe that there's probably a better way to do things than than we experienced as marchers growing up mm-hmm. and uh so that was the the genesis of it that's great now your amalgamation well your creation of UDB needed your cooperation with Pyware how did that connection occur? Yeah, so um, we first had a relationship with Pyware as drill writers, you know, um, and you know, I, <laughs> we we still have you know the old floppy disk, you know, from when my dad bought Pyware, you know, whenever it was, you know, many 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 years ago, nineteen eighty two. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is the year before I was born, but you know, but shortly after that, you know, he. Um, you know, he started buying Pyware as a, as a band director. And so we had familiarity with it, you know, and learning how to use it because we actually wrote some of the drill for our own high school. You know, he gave us that opportunity. And so we learned a lot, oh, uh, mostly great. about what not to do. <laughs> you know? While you were in school, you wrote the drill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And we also, it was sort of a, you know, he, he was, it was sort of a one man show. I mean, he, he had some staff here and there, but you know, if he, if he had a faculty meeting, like he needed us to run the band, you know? And so here we are as a sophomore, junior or senior, like, and we're running the rehearsal, we're making musical decisions, we're making drill decisions. Um, so, you know, he empowered us to do that. And then Luke and I became, if you will, sort of professional freelance drill writers for, for quite a while, you know? So we had a, a great relationship with Pyware and certainly understanding that they were, and they have continued to be, the industry standard, you know, we said, okay, well, we need to have a great relationship with these folks. And, um, so we, we had this idea and we approached them about it. And truthfully, they, they were like, well, we're not, we like the idea. We like what you guys are doing, but we don't really partner with any, anybody like that's not something we've done to this point. And so we had to sort of prove the model. Um, and there's some other nuance to the story, but essentially they saw that, um, we had a viable idea and the the community was excited about it. And so then we formalized um, an agreement. And so, you know, we've got an exclusive partnership with Pyware, uh, which is really, really powerful for us and for them, you know, because now the, the loop, if you will, everybody, the Pyware ecosystem really does reach the student where, you know, millions of kids around the world are tapping this file that connects to a Pyware file that somebody wrote, as opposed to just a PDF of something. So, you know, we have 
we believe that we have helped them connect to sort of the education community in a new way, you know, um, and we we also feel like this is allowing for them to, you know, optimize their software so that it's, of course, works well with our things, but, you know, allows for them to spend their time and their money and their effort really, really making the experience as good as possible for the drill designer. And I think that in our time together, you know, we've already seen a number of new things within the Pyware ecosystem already get stronger and better. So that's really, really exciting. And, you know, we we fully believe in what they do and how they do it and their customer service and all of those things. And so we're we're excited and we're really proud to to have that that association and that it's a it's truly a partnership with them. If I could speak to customer service for a minute, as I've been using UDB with the groups that I teach and write for, uh, whenever I've had a problem, either you or Luke has helped me. And then if it was a Pyware problem, you referred it to Amanda or Dustin and they repaired it. And then you guys collaborated. And I remember there's one time you guys couldn't figure out what, why one file wasn't working and Dustin and Amanda couldn't figure out what was what working. So you guys fixed it for me and just sent it over here. It's fixed. You're all set. <laughs> and beat the start of a rehearsal. So everything went wonderful. So, you know, for folks out there who are saying customer service, I don't think you can get any better customer service from UDB, nor can you get better cooperation of the source pi- Pyware to the UDB uh, use, user Pyware. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's it's something that's really, really important to us. And innately, we want to help because we we are teachers, you know, um, you know, but we also know what it's like to be on the blacktop and it's a hundred degrees and, you know, kids are, kids are showing up and this kid's sick and this kid's getting here late and you just need to start rehearsal and, you know, something doesn't happen. And whether it's a PDF of something or a, you know, UDB file or whatever, you know, I mean, when we get that phone call and we hear that metronome in the background and somebody's saying like, how do I do this? Like, there's like a level of energy that we have as if we're in rehearsal too. And it's like, we've got you like, tell your kids to go get some water. It's going to be fixed in 30 seconds. Tell them to get back out there, have a great rehearsal. You know, like that's, that's the level of sort of like, I guess sort of excitement that we, we carry with the opportunity to, to help the community. Mm -hmm. Um, And every single person on our team is a teacher. Like every person that you talk to, even our billing people, like they're teachers. Like if you say something, something's wrong with the back hash on this file, they know what you mean. <laughs> so that we take a lot of pride in that. Yeah. Well, I think from the from the teaching standpoint and the drill writer standpoint, what you've created has reduced the teaching time by at least 50%. Whereas before you'd look at a PDF of a drill or you'd have kids do dot books by hand. They don't have to. It's all right there in front of them. And then they can go back and watch the path in which they have to go or what yard line on what count they have to cross over. Uh, It has increased our ability to teach and to be an efficient teacher magnitudes that I can't even imagine anymore. So can we just back, we just back up a little bit. Um, What what year did you guys start UDB? So UDB um, was founded in 2010. And, um, and we started with uh, a version of a custom dot book experience. Um, when Luke and I were both marching at the cadets, we both had custom dot books that we created. Um, and we learned about a couple of other things. We said, all right, let's find maybe some waterproof ink, you know, since, you know, so that our dot books don't fall apart on the first day of, you know, a wet rehearsal. Um, yeah, so we had a little bit of experience doing that. Uh, but really sort of the genesis of, of all of that was, Luke was a marching member of something that is no longer around, unfortunately, but it's called the All-American Marching Band, um, which was an incredible program that was um, led by Brian Prado. um, But it was was an opportunity to bring the country's best senior high school marchers together and learn a show in a week and then perform that show at the end of the, or I'm sorry, at the halftime of the All-American Bowl, you know, which is a huge event. Um, and so he came back from that and he said, you know, we, we, we learned the show really fast, but there's still better ways for us to do this. And that was sort of just a jumping off point for all of the work that we had done together to say like, what if we put this in our dot book or what if we thought about this? And, you know, pedagogically, both he and I had very similar experiences because we both march at cadets. And so a lot of the things that are inside of the app that are just sort of second nature now for teachers and students, things like 
understanding the difference, um, you know, in step sizes from one set to a, to another and being able to practice the direction change early and frequently and understanding the crossing counts. Those are all things that, you know, were traditionally things that you would do later in the process when you're like cleaning at the season. You'd also have to figure those things out manually. And so we, we thought, all right, there's certainly a future where phones will become available to everybody let's let's build this into an app and so we had a couple of different iterations of physical books that that we used and that people liked and people didn't like and we learned from all of those and then we we started building the app in 2013 and the first iteration of the app came out in 2017 well i'm going to be honest um when we first started using ultimate drill book i was really hesitant to use the phones because i recognized as i'm sure all teachers do that phones are in my opinion, to, to use too much throughout their life. Right. And I felt like, well, here's two hours we're together. Let's get them off their phone. So I was resistant for a full year and we used the the flip book again and all that. And then when I decided we had the right group of kids to do it, you know, I was a little reluctant to have them have their phones out all the time in rehearsal, but I have found that, you know, the first day I had to be honest with them and said, look, I was reluctant to do this because I don't want you staring at your phones and on social media instead of being at rehearsal, right? Our, as a band director, we always think, get off the phone. We don't want the phone. We want you on your horn, right? Um, but we, we haven't had, I don't remember more than one or two problems in all the years that we've used it now. You know, I just was honest with them and kids are obviously so good at using the phones. It, it required us to um, make sure they had batteries that were charged, right? And they had to be planning ahead to make sure their cell phone battery didn't die, which of course still happens to everybody. But um, they had to make sure they had the latest, the latest update when they were on Wi-Fi, right? If, if that was an issue. Um, so I found that the phone issue has been amazing. I was a little reluctant, call me old school, but uh, I was really, I'm really happy that we're using it. Um, so what is, if people haven't heard about this before, obviously it's a custom drill book. Um, do you still offer the physical book or is it strictly app? So we still print, um, some, what we call, uh, we, we do have an ultimate drill book and we have an ultimate dot book. Um, you know, more and more people are moving away from the physical physical offerings. Um, and we want to build them if, if people feel like they will be helpful. Um, mo- most of our drum cores use a version of the dot book, but it's interesting. More and more are starting to just be 100% on the app. Um, all, every single one of them is, is relying on the app, but the book is sort of a... Um, you know, a, a secondary tool, if you will. But I think to your to your earlier point, um, the, you know, the students and really us, we sort of live on our phones. You know, I mean, that's it's the fastest way to the outside world, and so it's the thing that we're most comfortable with. And truthfully, it's probably the the single piece of hardware or single physical thing that we take the best care of. You know, all of us. <laughs> you know, um, and. You know, like sometimes a director will come up to us at a Midwest and say, like, oh, I'm afraid my kids are going to forget their phone. I said, when's the last time that you forgot your phone or a kid forgot their phone? You know, so and and we understand all of those, if you will, those concerns and those thoughts. And it's important for us to meet meet directors where they are, but really try to say not really where you are as a director, but let's go where your kids are, you know, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about some of these things. but. You know, the reality is, is that when we've used a coordinate sheet or drill charts to learn drill, we pass it out, which of course takes lots of time and copies and blah, blah, blah. But you pass it out, you give it to the kids and you say, all right, I want you to stand there quietly and don't do anything until I tell you to move left or right or forward or backwards. Like, I know it's hot, just stand there, you know, and that that's their experience. You know, whereas the information that's available inside UDB, now they can, you know, we want them to be engaged and certainly stand there, pay attention to the rehearsal, but there's so much more that you can do. And so there are protocols that we help, like when we do training with, you know, programs, which happens thousands of times a year now, which is exciting. We try to say, look, if you're starting with the app and you don't know how to deal with all of this information, use this simple method. So this is something we came up with actually a year or two ago. It's like, just remember the acronym ACDC. A, watch the animation. C, check out your crossing count. And then DC, practice the direction change. Every time that you go set up a set, have your students watch the animation, check out the crossing count, 
practice the direction change. And and by crossing count, you mean what what like what? you cross the certain yard line. Is that what you mean by crossing? Count? Exactly. Yeah. Because that, that will help calibrate their step size. If I've got 16 counts to go from page one to page two, and I cross this yard line on count three, you know, traditionally without that information, you're just going to do a bunch of reps and then try to figure out, okay, was that too big of a step size, too small of a step size, blah, blah, blah. Right. Here's an opportunity now for you to say, so long as I hit that yard line on count three, I know that my step size is right. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's why we display by default inside the app, it says X counts, which stands for crossing counts. So we've just said, look, now that you have all of this information, you, this is a better use of not only your time, but the student's time. They feel like their time is better used. You know, a coordinate sheet would be the equivalent of passing out a sheet of music and saying, here's the note that you play on beat one. And then here's the the last note that you play 16 counts later. We're going to do a bunch of reps and figure out what notes and what rhythms to play between those 16 counts. Well, the other thing that we found was that we had a young lady that was at camp for the first week, but then go on the second week. And I said to her, well, just take your phone. And when you get back on Saturday and Sunday, because we weren't practicing, come down to the field and go set by set and watching your direction of motion across the count. So we get back on the Monday after or whatever it was after she got back and 90% of the drill, she already knew. Right. <laughs> she already figured it out because she didn't need us to hold her hand. And kids have figured out they can come on the weekend on their own just to practice. and Right. right. Or if a kid's having a problem, you say, listen, you know, if you're here early, why don't you just go out on the field and practice for a while? Right. Yeah. What One of the things that I think we are – we're proud of a lot of different, um, I don't know, I, I guess different things that we have sort of realized are byproducts of compartmentalizing this information and sharing it with people in this way. But this now makes the students feel like they're more part of the process as opposed to there's one person on the tower who knows how this goes. You know, and if they if that person doesn't show up to rehearsal, like we don't know how to <laughs> to put this show together. Mm-hmm. So now this involves the students in the process, which is so exciting, right? It allows for them to at the beginning of rehearsal, they can come up to you and say, Mr. Smith, like, are we gonna get to that big like follow the leader thing or the big sun start? Like, those are things that they've never been able to say, but we've done that in every other aspect of our teaching experience with the students. We're going to let them hear a recording of Lincoln Sherposy or this Robert W. Smith piece or whatever it is. We're going to, we're going to use those resources available to us and let them experience what sort of the final product will be. And now they can do that, you know, with, with drill and truly like, this is just in like, um, this is what we're, what we've sort of quickly learned is that Yes, this is a drill app, but because you're spending less time and you're getting better at it faster, you are also playing at a higher level. Retention of the band is at a higher level because the students don't feel like their time is wasted. You know, so again, sort of thinking about everything through the educator lens, like there's there's not a decision that we make that doesn't that's not fueled by thinking about sort of the comprehensive student music, like music student experience. You've given us the gift of time is what you've really done. You've given us. More, I mean, we like Jeff said, we learn drill so much faster. And I'm sure it's the same for everybody around the country. And the student accountability piece is just so much. You're right; they have no excuse to not know what they're doing with everything that they have. It, it's just, it's just been brilliant. Cool. Um, Great to hear. I'm, I'm curious about the costs. I know what we do, but what are the, what is, what are the different costs that people can do? Like if they just sneak in and do something. And I know there's multiple levels of things they can do. Yeah, so the the app is just there's just two tiers, um, and it's just a flat fee per user for the year. Um, most programs use the pro version of our app, but I'll talk about both. Um, so we have UDB app, which is a regular regular version, really focuses on sort of just all of the things drill related, and that's just ten dollars a user per year. So for simple math, if you have 50, 50 students and five staff, you just buy fifty five licenses. And then that's good for the full year for as much music and drill as you want to put in there. You know, programs are using it for outdoor. They're using it for indoor. They're using it for parades. You know, we even, during my time at the University of Texas, we used it to set like our parade block. We would use it to set like how I want the students to sit in the stands for football games. We would use it for concert band seating charts, you know, just because the students had it and I could just, I could put it in Pyware real quick, hit export. They already knew how to look at it and engage with it. 
So you've got access to it year round. Um, and then the pro version, which is what um, most programs uh, have upgraded to now, of course, includes all of the things drill related um, that you would sort of experience in the app, like animation and audio and multiple files and allowing for custom views where you can look at just your section and those kinds of things. Then the pro, pro version includes um, a calendar and attendance taking system where it allows for you to take a, take attendance based on the student's GPS location. Uh, that's also a really robust um, sort of attendance management system that allows for you to like you and the student to see at any point their full attendance record. And at any point, if there's a discrepancy, you can say, hey, not a problem. I'll export this to you and you can take a look and see the exact time that you checked in the rehearsal. So that's a big feature that a lot of people um, upgrade for. There's another feature inside of the pro version uh, called tap ID, where you can tap on any performer's dot and then you'll see the student's name and picture pop up and the app builds that for you in the background. So you don't have to like upload a spreadsheet. You don't have to do any of those kinds of things. So tap ID is also a really popular feature that also helps you manage alternates. So you can see like, oh, I've got somebody who's shadowing this spot. So instead of me having to ask who's B7, and then waiting for the, you know, the response, you know, you can now just say like, hey, Sally, I know that you've been learning B2. We've got a now a hole in B3. Can you switch? Sally just taps B3. We're off and running. Um, and then the last feature in Pro right now that differentiates itself from the regular version is something called offline mode. And you can think about it as airplane mode uh, where it requires, requires the students to be in airplane mode to access their drill. So mm -hmm. for directors who are really concerned about that, that's oh. that's why we've built that feature. Um, and truthfully, between you and me and the listeners, um, people, they will buy it for that feature. And they say, honestly, I'm not worried about my kids on the phone because rehearsals are just going so much better. So I love it for calendar and attendance and for tap ID. So those are the two big versions. Uh, so it's 10 or $20 a user for the year. And that's just a flat fee. There's no additional costs. And band directors can do either how they want. They can just use their own budget money or each kid can pay the 10 or 20 bucks or yeah most most programs will purchase it at the program level so they'll you know the boosters will buy you know 100 licenses or whatever it is um because we have additional resources which i'll, I'll be happy to talk about in a second yep. um but a lot of programs can use curricular funds now because you know this is essentially the, te the textbook for the marching band you know or the you know, the building principal or building administrator says, okay, well, since we're not making copies, you know, of, you know, thousands of sheets of paper and whatever else, you know, then I'll allocate, I'll give you $5 and then the program pays $5. So most programs purchase it at the, at the program level. It does require that the full program sort of participate. Um, like a student can't just go and like upload their own drill. It does require it sort of from the top down. And that's really intentional just because we feel like we want everybody to have access to the same information. Um, so that's where that decision comes from. But uh, that's that's the gist of it. Um, and of course, we work with school districts now where, where they're buying it for the entire district. Um, you know, And of course, we offer discounts at the district level and for multi-year licenses and things like that. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. So you, you get going in a school year, you started with the marching band, you get to winter guard or winter percussion, you want to use it, but you have some kids that weren't in the marching band program. Can you add them in during the course of the season? Yeah, it's very easy to add additional licenses. Um, what I would first recommend is, hey, marching band season's over and you had 100 kids in the marching band, you know, and you've got 70 kids in your indoor program or whatever it might be, right? You can actually just remove kids from the marching program once that season's over. And any director can just go into their account, tap on ensemble and just swipe left to remove any students that aren't going to be using it for indoor. And now those licenses are available for indoor. Um, right. So you can reuse those licenses with, uh, with additional personnel, or you can say, you can reach out to us and say, Hey, I need seven more licenses. We're adding a movement line to our indoor show. And we just do that for you online super quickly. And then those licenses are available immediately. So I have one question that runs in my head. So we use UDB, but I still send out a video of the drill from the real view perspective. Has there ever been a thought of having that being included within the program? So yes, the kids can use the dot by dot going from dot to dot. But when all said and done, then they can go and see a, the video 
of the uh, entire drill in the real view perspective. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's on our sort of ever growing list of things to consider, um, you know, and what we really believe is that, you know, the real view perspective is built for the designer and for the teacher. You know, it's not a, in our, in our experience, it's not like a true teaching tool. The kids can't glean, but so much out of it. Certainly they can understand, okay, cool. This, this rotation happens this way. Here's how, you know, this follow the leader works, whatever it might be. Um, but, um, there are certainly opportunities that we're looking at in the near future that would allow for you to take other media files and then share them and say, these things belong together. So then that could be available to the students and to the teachers. So do you have any statistics or, or anything about the amount of schools that are using UDB? Um, so we don't, we don't openly share the total number of schools and users, um, you know, but we are really proud to be represented in tens of thousands of classrooms around the world now, um, starting at the kindergarten level in Japan, wow. <laughs> all the way up through, uh, you know, the drum corps level. So uh, we're really, really proud of of the adoption um, that's, that's happening worldwide. We did launch in Japan um, a couple of years ago. It's really sort of the market is picking back up there now, um, sort of after, after COVID. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, we're, we feel like we're really well, well represented at the high school level, especially at the college level, um, and certainly at the drum corps level. But, you know, we're, so much of our focus is, you know, getting out to the areas where we feel like truly need the most amount of help. You know, it's, it's easy for, you know, a band with 300 kids and a huge budget to say like, of course, we're going to buy this. But, you know, truthfully, the way that we think about this, and this is, again, all of the decisions that we make are through this lens, but like, how can this be helpful for the one band director that has no staff? And my argument to, to anybody who says like, yeah, I don't have much of a budget is look, there's not going to be a single thing that you're going to spend $10 per kid on all year. That's this valuable right. or $20, you know, um, that, and that, that can literally be the difference between the kid deciding to come back to rehearsal tomorrow or not because they feel like their time is more valuable. They feel like they understand the experience. So we're really proud of the adoption so far. And, you know, we, we still have a lot of work to do, but we're really excited about it. So you mentioned Japan recently, and I was seeing some of your social media posts about that. Could you tell us about that trip and what, what it was all about? Yeah. Um, sort of where to begin. Cause I mean, it's, it's such like a, such an emotional um when, when we think about it i mean it's it's the coolest thing that we've ever done um we've been really fortunate to go um we started going there in 2018 uh where we where we met with a number of groups to learn about their system um you know for those who haven't watched japanese marching band um you're missing out i mean it's it's exceptional um and of course they don't do it on a football field because football is not a thing there. Um, but, um, we had to learn about their system, you know, and they march on an indoor 30 by 30 meter, uh, floor that has what they call points, you know? And so when you look at the, the floor, there's a huge plus sign. And then in each, in each quadrant, there's additional plus signs and those are what are called points. And that's how they measure, um, against things that those are the equivalent of like tashes and, and yard lines for us. So we had to go just to sort of learn about their system. And then we had to work with somebody to not only translate the app into Japanese, but then translate, you know, some of the learning practices into sort of how they learn. Um, but we've, we've been going over there since 2018. Um, and this trip, we were there for, I think it was about 14 days. So it was a, it was a solid trip. Um, and we spent, spent the time traveling the country, connecting with groups that have, that are now using UDB there, everything from kindergarten marching bands, uh, all the way up to sort of community drum corps. And, um, it's an unbelievable country. And I, I imagine that no matter what you would travel there for, you would return saying the same thing. I mean, just the people are incredible. The country is incredible and the culture there of, of the things that we know and love as music educators. I mean, it's, it's really strong. <laughs> um, and so it's just so eye opening, and the, the people there are so accepting of, um, 
of us, which is, I mean, that we, 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 we feel completely spoiled, you know, just, it's amazing for us to be able to go there, you know, and really just be fans of what they do and how they do it. And, um, it's cool. You know, we now have enough of a relationship with them that they're sharing new ideas and saying, it'd be great if we could do this and it'd be great if we could do this. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's such an incredible place and we're really enjoying that ride. Um, and we think that this is going to lead to some unique opportunities in Thailand for us. Um, and it's also teaching us how to sort of look at the world market, um, for this. And, you know, we now have groups in Indonesia and in Brazil using our, our software, even if it's not in their right language, they're using it to teach people who have never marched before in their life, how to do this thing. And so it's, it's really, really cool. And the, the, the trip to Japan was very much that for us. And it's just, it's, we're so fortunate to be able to, to spend our time there and, you know, and, and that they're adopting this technology. That's wonderful. I, I remember my first time seeing a Japanese marching band many years ago from two of my staff members from Cavaliers who were teaching them. And uh, when I looked at it the first time, I said, this is phenomenal. The accuracy is beyond belief. And I can't, Im I can just imagine how much even more accurate they are with using UDB and helping them to learn even faster than what they learn. And they learn at a rapid rate as it is. Yeah. <laughs> when we, I mean, we go to these rehearsals and, you know, and they, they know that we're music educators and, you know, and then they'll say things to us like, would you like to speak to the group and make some suggestions? It's like, I don't know what I can say to you guys. Like, this is, you guys are exceptional, you know? Um, but it's, yeah, I mean, one of our big dreams is to create an exchange program to bring Japanese music educators to the U.S. and U.S. music educators to Japan. Because we say, how do they do this? And they say, how do you guys do this? And so Luke and I are looking at each other. It's like, we just all need to get in the same room, you know? Um, so it's, yeah, it's it's the level of precision and the level of um, sort of all of the things that we think are not possible. They sort of blow that out of the water. And, you know, yep. you, you listen to an elementary school that sounds like a collegiate wooden ensemble here, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's most humbling. definitely. Oh, it's yeah. humbling. When you watch the... <laughs> These kids sit down and they play Overture to Candide, and then you ask how old they are, and they're, they're saying, oh, <laughs> right. the oldest is an eight-year-old. Eight and I'm saying, those clarinets are playing that. Right. Yeah. Right. It's it's incredible. It's incredible. And we're so fortunate to have this opportunity to, to, be, to be part of music education there. Have you gotten into the European uh, Winter Guard area where they're using UDB over there in Netherlands and in England? Yeah, so we're we've actually been um, we've we've had groups who are per participating in DCE and DCUK um, for a number of years, which is great. Um, and similar to what what I was talking about in some some of the other countries that I mentioned, you know, the community band that sort of led the charge here in the U.S., like in the nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties, seventies, you know, that's a really big thing in Europe still, you know. And there are groups that are now turning that model into the indoor winds or the drumline battle or the those kinds of things and honestly when a group contacts us from there and says hey we'd like to use this for a you know i've got seven of my buddies and we're doing a, a thing you know and we're going to compete in dcuk's like indoor drumline battle or whatever it might be i mean we we just we're thrilled you know and we want to do everything that we can to help those groups and so it's we we've been traveling there regularly um luke has uh, Luke's been going there the past few years, and uh, we, we love being a part of that as well. So you have two new products, Beam and Stride. Could you talk about those for us, please? Yeah. Yeah, so um, Beam, we soft launched in, um, or we launched as a public beta uh, this past fall, and it's a sheet music organization distribution and rehearsal application. It allows for you to digitize your sheet music library and then allows for instant access. You know, if I'm a piccolo player, I can pull up the piccolo parts for everything in my, my library and have access to, to everything online or offline. But then also allows for you as a director to say, okay, I want to allow for my section leaders to be able to annotate on a part. And then that shows up for everybody else in the section. So we know that that's a huge part of any rehearsal where you say like, 
please, I hope everybody brought their pencil. Like, can you please mark that mezzo forte or that's still an A natural or whatever it might be, right? Now you can just rely on one person to annotate that and that's going to show up on everybody else's part instantaneously. So that's a huge part of what's what's convenient about Beam. But then we also have um, a feature called Live Mode, which allows for the director to pull up a piece and then with or without internet, it pulls up that same piece on everybody else's device. Um, it also allows for you to do things like you can say like, okay, we're not going to be rehearsing for a moment to, and I want to save a little bit of battery life. So you can turn off everybody's screen with or without internet. So the the future of rehearsal, especially as it relates to music, we feel like Beam is going to be a really integral part of, much like UDB is when delivering information in the marching rehearsal. So, so within the Beam concept, so say, I'll, um, just, we'll take over to the Candide. If somebody's already within the UDB families downloaded all the parts to Overture to Candide, is there a sharing process so that not everybody has to be scanning everything into program. So we are not doing we're not we're not doing anything as it relates to sort of library sharing. I mean, really, this this has to be if so long as you have the permission to perform and archive that piece, then you have you know that's controlled within the ensemble. We would like to think that down the road, you know, through some partnerships with publishers, we could we can maybe help that process. You know, um, because truthfully, what we want to do especially as it relates to the sheet music and just sort of music experience in general, is we want to make it easier for directors around the world to do things legally. Right. right. Um, and what we do know is that until either the laws are updated or until a, a system that comes out that everybody trusts works, you know, then that's going to be really tough. And so we, we see Beam as an opportunity to eventually be able to do that. So we're in some early uh, conversations with some composers who are very interested in looking at it as a distribution platform where we want to do things like allow for, you know, you as a program, you can pay you know, a small monthly fee to have access to this composer's library to sight read their music with your students, you know, for 30 minutes a week or, you know, and then when you're ready to buy it, then it's just one click and that's money that goes directly to the composer, you know, but then also that's giving you and your students access to the music of great composers who they might not otherwise know about. So again, this is really just sort of the nucleus of the beginning of lots of new things. Um, but Beam launched as a public beta completely for free um, to the community, whether you are a UDB user or not. Um, and we have just announced that it's actually going to stay free for another year and a half. Um, so whether you're in concert band or marching band or pep band, uh, we want we want you to use it. Tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like. And we're really fortunate to have, you know, a really um, hungry and invested community of UDB users who are saying like, great, this is turnkey. I can just tell my kids to punch in an ensemble code and there's our music and we can rehearse and I'm not spending time looking for a part that's missing now. And, you know, we were just, we were at an incredible rehearsal at Prairie View a and University in Houston uh, where the director of bands, Dr. Timmy Zachary, right after the rehearsal come, you know, finishes, a student comes in and says, Dr. Zachary, I'm confused about this part. It just seems really thick. I'm not sure how my part lines up with everybody else's. And he said, cool, we'll just pull up the score real quick. And the student said, I can do that. Yeah, so the student pulled up the score on their device, saw the other things that needed to line up vertically. And they said, oh, cool. So I just need to have a sectional with the second clarinets. And he said, yep, that's exactly right. And then the next student that came in, he had a similar question. He said, well, look, I've already annotated this in my score, so why don't you take a look? And the student then could look at that. You know, so there's right. a lot of power in information sharing. It just needs to be put into a package that people can trust and that's reliable. Um, and so that's that's the genesis of Beam. So it's going to be, it'll remain free. Uh, so anybody who is interested in you know getting a set of Beam licenses for any of your ensembles, Beamapp.live. Um, it's going to be com completely free for the next year and a half, and then we'll soon start supporting choirs and orchestras as well. Um, so um, that's me. Well, while you're thinking of that, oh no! So okay. what if what do people typically use for the device to to see the music? So um, 
you know, Beam has sort of initiated or sort of first come on the market most um, applicable to like athletic bands. So that you know the students are using their phones just like they are for you know UDB in, in rehearsal, and most directors are using their iPads. Now more and more students are using tablets or you know are getting tablets, um, and so of course it works beautifully on that. But just like in UDB, you know, if you make a an annotation on your phone, that annotation is going to show up on their tablet, and much like UDB was like when we started dreaming it up in 2010, we knew that phones would become the norm. You know, we really believe that sheet music will be digital, you know, and that will become the norm. And so we're really trying to skate to where the puck is going, That's you know, awesome. and believe that, that that will be the way that people f- know and trust for sheet music distribution and rehearsal purposes. So people can use it on their tablets or their phones just fine. And it's, it's amazing, you know, so much, so much of the work that our development team has done has been on making sure that the experience is really fast, but then also the music's really high quality. So you can still zoom in like infinitely. And because it's a vector based image, it it doesn't lose any quality. And you use like a MacBook. So um, traditionally the answer would be no. However, with where Apple is going, Right, because now they're using chips in their desktop computers that are also similar to what they do on mobile devices. You can run mobile applications on new versions of Apple computers. So you could actually run UDB on your computer. There's not built for that, but it, you can do that. So again, that's where we're skating is like we're building it first to be a mobile experience, mostly because the value of you being able to be in rehearsal and somebody sends you a new PDF for a warm up or here's the here's a new tag for the end of the show or whatever it might be we want you to be able to distribute that in a mobile fashion and say like well i don't have my laptop i can't do it till later so to answer your question um newer apple computers are able to run this on their desktop um as a mobile application but we will eventually build out a sort of a web-based version of this as well. So it can be accessed on any. I only ask because I'm in one of those schools that has one-to-one laptops. So every kid has a a laptop, you know, so like for us personally, that would be the easiest way to do it. Sure. Sure. So how about Stride? Yeah. um, Really, really excited about Stride. Um, So Stride, we also soft launched um, in, um, in the fall of 2022. And Stride is a media platform. You can think about it as Netflix for the arts. Um, What we have learned time and time again is that while there are more resources out there than they've ever been, you know, which is a a good thing sort of traditionally for, for us and for access for our students, it's becoming more difficult to find the content that you can trust. So, for example, you know, if I'm teaching a trombone student and I say, hey, I want you to go find a, a video of Joe Alessi, just just Google it or just YouTube it. Like you're going to find maybe a Joe Alessi video, but then also people are like, you know, me trying to be Joe Alessi or whatever, whatever it might be. Okay. Um, yep. And because we're so because we're so connected to the teacher and to the administrator and to the student, we thought there needs to be a, a singular place that has high quality highly curated content that people can go to and trust and know that it's a safe place for me to send, you know, a fourth grader, but then also a safe place for an adult to go and learn. Mm -hmm. So stride is going to be become a really, really unique part of the, um, the activity. And I mean, activity sort of as a whole, because one of the things that we, we so believe in is, you know, while like a clinic at Midwest, you know, is, incredible and it's it's invaluable you know we really believe that access to that kind of information should be more available to those to then just those who can afford to be there for that time and that place Mm -hmm. so our our goal with stride is to create unique partnerships with you know the best best teachers that are out there and the best clinics that are out there and then make these things available year round, but then also curate them into a place so that they're available to relevant learning styles. So, you know, we we so, so believe and, and really the pandemic helped confirm this, but, you know, the future of learning and really sort of the present of learning is so reliant on asynchronous learning, right? So like, if I'm going to learn how to change the oil on a car or whatever it is, I'm probably going to find a a YouTube video and I'm going to watch it four or five times. Right. 
and I'm going to watch it at my leisure when I'm ready to learn it again, or I'm, or I'm about to do this, let me watch it one more time. And because that information is available to me multiple times, you know, I'm going to engage with it in a new way, right? I'm going to engage with it in a more reliable way, you know, and we all know that almost none of us are built to just learn between the hours of like eight and three when school happens. So we want to do that same kind of thing. And we want to, we want to partner with our universities and allow for their teachers to put high quality lessons on our platform so that we can share those with the students that they want to reach. So there is such a, there's an incredible opportunity for our ecosystem to, um, to really benefit from what's available out there. It just needs to be in one place where people can trust it. So Stride is that. Um, it's You can go to it right now. It's um, it's just very, very much in like a soft beta launch, but uh, stridetv.co. Um, but the goal is by next December for us to have many hundreds of lessons, high quality lessons, everything from how to choose the right saxophone read to understanding dance positions to you know, understanding set and prop design, you know, and that's just the, the, the beginning of what stride will be. But um, the goal is to make information as available to the community as possible. And certainly the the web is the way to do that. And through high quality, um, high quality lessons um, that'll be available on there. And we'll also have some entertainment things in there as well, which will be fun. Wonderful. I, I just want to mention again, you know, we I met with John McAllister uh, about a month ago from John McAllister Music. And I told him when I see an educator who takes their own personal passion for what we do, and then they pair it up with a talent or expertise or area that they have, in this case, your brother and yourself, and then you do something so great for the entire music education, um, what, what we do, it's really amazing to hear that. And that's why I wanted to, to spotlight you and your company, because you know, I think there's a lot of other educators too that I'm trying to reach out and say, there's other people with ideas that are like yours that I th are probably thinking, well, this is a good idea, but I don't really know how I would do it. And I just want to encourage those people to, you know, I know we're trained to be teachers, right? Most of us are trained as music educators, but how can you use that, your other gifts in a music education way to help further the, the entire activity? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I love that mission and it's, you know, of course, that's something that resonates with with us, who we are, what we've chosen to do, you know, and and we say the same thing. And and even when I was teaching at the university level and I'm training sort of the teachers of tomorrow, if you will, like, you know, our belief is that, you know, the, the things that you're learning how to do right now, you know, the, the piece of paper that you're going to walk out this door with, like, that's the bare minimum, you know, like, because everybody else is graduating with that same piece of paper. So what do you bring to the table that is a unique experience? You know, what do you bring to the table that's a unique angle? You know, and the things that I think when we really go through those exercises with teachers, like you might find you're like, wait a second, you're like a great, like, you know, like you're a great artist. Like, what if we like put some of these music lessons like in a cool, you know, sort of illustrative way, or you're a great teacher. You're, I'm sorry, you're a great cook. Like, what if we taught music lessons while we had a chili cook off? Like, I mean, what, whatever, you know, <laughs> there's so many opportunities to take these things that truly are related and then put them together and do things with them. And that's, that's very much how Luke and I are wired, you know? And I think that, I think that other teachers should really have that opportunity. And I think to your point, you know, let's let's see how we can make that more feasible to them and and honestly that's a huge part of what we're doing with stride also like you know we've we've come across stuff on youtube where there's a great like here's a great saxophone alternate fingering video and you know this person's you know they've got 17 views because they've made 17 of their kids go to that video but it's like well look we know how to market things we know how to package things and we know how to get that in front of 5000 saxophone players who will look at this as their daily you know, routine. Like, so we want to, we want to find the educators who are doing this at a high level already. They just may not know how to package it and then say, here's a community where you can do that. Well, I think you've done a great job. I, I know that every year I talk to different clients. I say, listen, you, you've got to go to UDB. You've, you've got to stop doing dot books and you got to stop doing a coordinate sheets and there is in PDFs and just go to UDB and you're going to teach half the time. And, and I find that 
some the thing that becomes an obstacle sometimes is our instructors instructors who have done the years of drum corps like all of us did and they're so used to doing their handmade dot books and their handmade sheets and everything and i keep saying to them and it rains and what do you do and they all look at me like i've got two sets of extra eyes and i say what do you do and they say well we have to start all over again i said well, with UDB, all you simply do is take a sandwich bag, put your cell phone in a sandwich bag, close the sandwich bag, and you've got that drill forever on that iPad or um, on the cell phone. And I said, furthermore, you go and you, you get done with the rehearsal one evening and you call your drill writer and you say, you know, sets 22, 23, and 24 aren't working for us. And can you look at that? So the drill writer goes, whips out their computer, adjusts 23, 20, 22, 23, 24, hits, goes over to the app, sends it, and then the director looks at, well, how does that look for you? Oh, yeah, that worked fine. Now, how are you going to send that to the kids? I said, it's already there. Whereas, as that Pearson is using the paper or the coordinate sheets, you got to go there and take out the pencil and write it all over again. You don't have to. And then the kids can write notes in their UDB app about that set right there right i I think you've given us a new way of looking at things and i think one of our biggest obstacles is our older instructors and i'm a pretty old instructor Mm -hmm. in comparison to all of you and we've got to open our eyes to the fact that as you said earlier this is where the hockey puck's going and we've got to be ahead of it so that we can make sure we make a wonderful teaching environment for all of our students. And I do love that theme and stride are, yeah. not, and I don't, I don't mean by just marching band, but there's so many, everybody can use that stuff. Well, if you don't have a marching band, UDB is, you're not going to do a lot for it, right? But right. I love it that it's complete music education. And I didn't know that about your company. Neither did I. Um, and I teach a community band of adults, and I'm going to go home after our meeting tonight, and I'm going to get Beam out and see how I can make that work for them. Because... They all have cell phones. They all have tablets. So if I can make it so that I can say something in rehearsal, write it in my tablet, and it goes out to all of them, and I don't have to say, didn't I say that to Metzl Piano? But they have to read what's on the paper, Jeff. If they don't read what's on the paper, it doesn't matter. Well, I'll do it really <laughs> bold. Maybe it's just my students who miss all the dynamics. <laughs> no, I, I I appreciate that. And, you know, it's Luke and I, I mean, it's... It, this is this we're really fortunate that this is a passion project that is more than that you know and and you know everybody on our team you know i mean all all day long you know i've i've been on meetings about why why does this button go here or like well, well what if we put it here and it's like well when you're playing piccolo like it's a little bit hard of a reach you know or if you're playing like a four valve tuba like you know i mean everything that we every decision we make is is through the lens of knowing knowing this life you know and um so we're just we're excited about how directors and students feel like i was worried about this but like five minutes in like i just I, it just felt normal you know do you have any as we close up do you have any messages that you'd like to give do you have a music education audience well um i mean maybe through this this lens first but um you know, for, for those who are hesitant about, you know, their students using using phones on the field or whatever it might be, um, you know, one, ask a director who is using UDB and say, tell me how you've dealt with that. Uh, but then two, just like give the students the benefit of the doubt, you know, and run a good rehearsal, you know, and just make things move along. If if you're worried about that they have enough time on their phones to to screw around, like you're probably moving too slow in rehearsal, you know, um, but like you know, this is why we've got, you know, three weeks of free trials. Like, so just, you just tell us, you can say, I need 5,000 licenses for three weeks. I'm going to, I'm going to try to learn my drill with it. Great. We'll just give it to you completely for free. You know, we'll do the training with you guys. Um, Cause I think that you're going to see immediately, you know, that the students just say like, wait, this is way better than coordinate sheets. And so they're going to be more invested. So that's, I guess a small little pitch there, but you know, if if you're concerned about this stuff, talk to somebody who's done it or talk to us. You know, we're we're all teachers as well. And we also try to make it as easy as possible so that you don't you don't feel like you have to invest just to figure it out. Um and I guess maybe the the other thought just sort of in general is that um 
you know, we've we've certainly over the past couple of years, we've been faced with a new level of questioning about the profession. I think, you know, in, in all areas, not just music teaching, but being a science teacher or being a PE teacher or whatever it is. Um, and there's there's a world of students out there who need us. That doesn't mean that we're responsible. We don't ha- we don't have to be there for them, but there's an opportunity for us to be there for them in a way that resonates most with you. And, and I mentioned that because, you know, you might be a great teacher and maybe you don't belong in the classroom. Maybe you're a great private teacher or maybe you can teach online, you know, through something like Stride or have a Patreon or through YouTube. Like, you know, the gift that I think that great teachers have, like there's a way to use that and it doesn't just have to fit into the traditional academic mold. And so I think that if there's, you know, I've talked to teachers time and time again, who are like, look, I love this. I just don't know if I can do this forever, (laughs) you know? And so think creatively about, like you were just saying, ways to connect with an an audience that knows how to use those talents in another, another way, you know? Um, so, you know, I, I don't have any answers beyond that other than just sort of believe that there's really unique opportunities out there for you to use use those skills that I think a lot of teachers have as like a natural talent. Well, I just want to say thank you for making time to be with us. I know you're busy and you have a lot going on, but your willingness to make this happen is really special to us. So thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. I thank you for all the help you've given me getting other clients of mine to join on. And thank your mother and father for what they did to make <laughs> you and your brothers. <laughs> but. Thank you. Well, it's it's still a family business. Our mom and dad still still work for us. So, you know, um, Great. It, it means a lot. So thank you so much, guys. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.